morning. I want to welcome you all to Arab First Baptist Church. I want to start by reading Psalm 24, 3 through 6. It says this, Who shall ascend the Lord, the hill of the Lord, excuse me, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of God of, of the God of Jacob, Selah. And this is a, a verse and verses and a song that we're about to sing that at times uh, can be confusing. And I want to make sure that I try to bring some clarity to that. O.S. Hawkins commented on these verses and he said this, Our hands are dirty with sin and our hearts are far from pure. The hill that is mentioned in these verses is Mount Calvary, and only one person in human history met the righteous demands of the law accompanied by these two qualifications, clean hands and a pure heart. His name was Jesus. His clean hands became dirty with our sin, so our hands could become clean. His pure heart became filled with our sin, so our hearts could become pure in God's eyes. So now, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? You and I can, but only only because of what Jesus did. I want us to stand and sing that this morning. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. good to see you this morning, and we do indeed invite you to Christ, as Andrew just said, is the only one who can give us the clean hands and the pure heart to ascend the hill of the Lord. And uh, whether or not we realize it or not, these pews, they are the hill of the Lord. This is where the Lord has chosen to meet with his people in his congregated body. And so we invite you to be a part today. We welcome you. And if you're a first-time guest, we want to welcome you uh, and ask you to do something for us. Would you take your bulletin that hopefully you received on the way in and on the side there's a perforated tab. We would uh, 
simply ask you, would you fill that out? Just with your information, with your contact information, uh, we want to be able to get in touch with you. We also want to know how we can serve you best here in this community and as this faith family of First Baptist. It's a joy today because we are celebrating baptism again. It is always a joy to stir the baptismal waters. And next week, let me just uh, mention, next week we're going to do this again. We're going to celebrate baptism and also communion. So next week will be a communion service. And these are the two ordinances the Lord has given us as a church. One, baptism, is that celebration of identification where someone says, I have decided to follow Jesus. I'm identifying with him. Next week, we'll do that again, but also we'll couple it with communion, which is the celebration of continuation, where we partake of the symbolic elements that represent the body and blood of the Lord. We are saying we are continuing in our walk with Jesus. We are continuing to follow after him, as we've indicated with baptism. So we want to invite you to be back uh, and be a part of that next Lord's Day. A couple of things to note in the bulletin. I'll, I'll just let you turn your attention to all the things, but next Saturday, again, is our new member orientation class, and so if you have not registered for that and you have joined since September, we encourage you to do that. If you're a longtime member and you say, I just want refreshing on the mission, vision, values of ARAP First Baptist, sign up for that as well, and we'd love to see you Saturday from 9 to noon. Uh, if you have already signed up, we'll follow back in touch with you this week just to confirm that. Also, on Saturday, that same day, if you're not participating in that, we hope you can be involved in the Four Friends Golf uh, Tournament, the Scramble. That's uh, All the proceeds will go to raising funds for our Four Friends International Ministry, and so you want to be a part of that. But hey, let's turn our attention to the baptistry as Brother Jeremy Yates, our children's ministry coordinator, is here for baptism. Jeremy, take it away. I've got here Charlie Stewart. She came to us during vacation Bible school, said she has made the decision to follow Christ. She wants to make Jesus the Lord of her life, and she said, I want to be baptized, and we want to make that happen. So is that what happened, Charlie? Is that your proclamation of faith? Yes, sir. All right. Well, based on that, Charlie, it's my pleasure and my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Jesus in baptism, and you're raised to a newness of life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for these decisions that were made, Father. Father, I pray that you continue to bless her, bless her family, Father. Father, I pray that you just keep her close, Father. And Father, as we go throughout this worship service, Father, may our songs of worship be pleasing to you, Father. Be with Andrew and be with David as we continue worshiping you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Revelation 4 8 says in there, day and night, the creatures of heaven never cease to say, and I want you to read this with me. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Let's stand and sing that this morning. Holy, holy, holy is the
strength and glory and power be to you the only wise king holy 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 is the lord god almighty who was and is and is to come with all creation i sing praise to the king of
through 15 say this, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? What man shows him is counsel.
kids are dismissed to worship kids style. Thank you, brother, for leading us and our praise team. If you have your Bibles, please, please open to Psalm chapter 2. I hope you were praying with Andrew during that prayer because I tripped on the stairs and fell. And uh, I'm really hoping you were praying. Nonetheless, self-deprecation in case you weren't and you were watching. I just wanted to admit and acknowledge that, yes, it did happen. But we're in Psalm chapter 2. And uh, we're going to read the entirety of the psalm and just ask the Lord's help one more time. Obviously, I'm in need of it. I can't even walk up on the platform. And so, another reminder of my frailty and my need to ask him for help. Psalm chapter 2. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he, the Lord, will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we do come to you now through the blood of your Son and by the enabling and help of your Spirit. And we ask you to really let us do what we just sang, what we just encourage one another to do in song, to, to behold our God. Make us like the Apostle John who long ago on the island of Patmos, on the Lord's day, was in the Spirit, and he was carried away. And the first thing that happened was he saw a vision of Jesus. So, Lord Jesus, we pray you would do the same thing today, that you would open our eyes to see wonderful things in your law, and you would open our understanding to help us to see how your law points to yourself. And then, God, you would move our hands and our feet into action to this lost and dying world. We pray this now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen, church. Isn't it interesting that most of our, our legend tales, most of our mythologies involve some sort of king? And, and typically there's a, a good king, almost a... Uh, like the archetype king, the, the, the king above all kings, a, a good king who, who has come and who has reigned and who has ruled well. And this king has, has brought in a period of prosperity and has uh, executed justice for his people in such a way that, that that king's reign is looked upon as the golden age. And so we have stories like Robin Hood there's the good king, but the king's away. Good King Richard's away, and so Robin Hood's having to, to do the best he can to hold things up in the presence of the wicked sheriff, sheriff of Nottingham. There's the good king, but he's gone now. We're longing for his return. We got Camelot, the story of Arthur. No matter what version of the Arthurian legend you like to uh, uh, read or watch or think about, that, that, that's the general story. We got King Arthur... He was the prophesied one, the long-awaited one. He came and he reigned in the period of prosperity. His kingdom was known as Camelot. And all things well happened in Camelot. But now the, the, he's gone, right? And so there is, even baked into the Arthurian legend, there's, there's this promise of a return of Arthur. 
Or even some more contemporary versions, and those of you who know me well knew I would go there. You take something like the Lord of the Rings. And what's the last piece in that trilogy entitled? It's entitled The Return of the King. The hands of the king bring healing with them, and things will blossom and things will flourish when the king comes back. All of the good tales really have this baked into them. There's a king, a good king, an archetype king. He's reigned, but now he's gone, and we look for him to come back. Now, as Americans, and I'm assuming we're all Americans in this room, there may be some who are not, but as Americans, we don't like kings around here, do we? I mean, that's how the whole thing got kicked off, wasn't it? We didn't, we didn't want a king reigning over us. In fact, in the Declaration of Independence, it states, our founding father said, a prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. We don't like kings. Our founding fathers had great, dreadful antipathy towards the idea of a tyrant ruling over us, and so they instituted this great experimental government that we're still holding on to somewhat, right? Right? This democratic republic. But what we as Christians and those grounded in the word of God must come to understand is that democracy is more like medicine than it is like food. It might heal some things temporarily. It might ease the pain in some ways. And certainly, like Winston Churchill said, democracy... It is the worst form of government besides every other form of government. Some of y'all catch that later when you're eating lunch, right? Hey, I get what he's saying. So it is good in some ways, but it's good like medicine, not like food. And deep in the human heart, we all have a longing for a king. We want to be ruled with a loving rule and yet we don't want to be ruled we don't want to be ruled and yet we do long to be ruled we, we attach ourselves and yes we as Americans we don't have kings but we make other kings right we, we turn our celebrities into kings and we turn sports figures into kings and some of us have this fascination with the royal family in, in England and so we follow what, what all the princes and the princesses are doing and all the drama with, with Henry and you know, Harry, whatever it is. You know, we're like, all right, we're all into that. Why? Because we... Is it Harry or Henry? Henry, okay. We're into that because like, there's something about that. We want to attach ourselves to the power and the prestige and the, and the protection that a the dynasty promises. We want to be ruled, and yet we don't want to be ruled. Our hearts are divided. And it is to this divided heart that the human condition gives us that Psalm 2 speaks into. And what Psalm 2 screams at the very core of its song is this. We, in fact, do have a king. Verse 6, the Lord himself, God himself says, As for me, I have set my king. I have established my king, God says. There is a king. We have a king. But the second truth is we hate the king. We'll come back to that in a minute. But the last truth we're going to look at today, yes, we do have a king. And it may be true that we hate the king, but, oh, church, we desperately Need the king. Let's look at that first statement here. We have a king. Again, verse 6, God says, As for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. So here's some, some earthly kings, and they're saying something. We're going to get to that in a minute. And they're saying something, and they really don't like the rule that's over them, and so they're uh, putting forward a, a different kind of rule. And yet God himself says, No, 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 no. Um, I think I have the final word here. I want you to know, kings of the earth, there, there is a king already. And I have established him. We have a king. It's, it's a theme that if you look throughout the, the scriptures, the, the theme courses throughout the entire Bible, right? 
as the old preacher said, from Genesis to maps, right? There's this idea of a king. In fact, in the garden itself, the Garden of Eden, what does the Lord God tell the man and the woman? He says, be fruitful and multiply throughout the earth, right? He is calling them with regal language to be his vice regents, his royal representatives, to image him throughout the entire globe so that when the creation sees the man and the woman, they will see a picture, a representation of God himself, the king. When God called Abram from Ur of the Chaldees, Remember, he told him in Genesis 15, or excuse me, Genesis uh, 12, he says, kings are going to come from you. There's this idea of a king. Moses himself foresees the day when a king will come. When in Deuteronomy chapter 17, he lays down the laws for a king. Also, when it happens that a king sits on his throne, he shall what? Take for himself a copy of this law and write it in a book. That's the first thing the king's supposed to do, Moses says in Deuteronomy 17, verse 20. He shall read it all the days of his life, and it may be with him that he may learn all these different things, how to rule well. God's idea from the beginning was to set up a king from the garden to Abraham through to Moses, and it finds its epicenter in the Old Testament in the life of David. This man after God's own heart. Which if you remember, in the book of 2 Samuel, we have the story of how David uh, finally rose to the the kingship, right? And he's got all these battles, and for a while Saul's chasing him. He had the whole David and Goliath thing, but, you know, uh, that did not pan out the way maybe he thought it was going to pan out. And so Saul's trying to kill him. He's running for his life for years and years and years, and he gets vagabonds to join his team, and... Eventually, he has to flee out of his native land of Israel. He has to go to the Philistines, the enemy. But God sovereignly orchestrates the circumstances so that he comes back. And for a few years, about seven, he reigns over Judah and Benjamin. But then the first few chapters of 2 Samuel tell us how he finally gets all of Israel under his reign. In chapter 6 of 2 Samuel, the Ark of the Covenant, that physical symbol of God's presence, comes into Jerusalem the place where David had conquered and was going to set up his capital. And that's the whole verse where David's, you know, throwing off his clothes and dancing. And his wife didn't like that too much. But finally, the ark of God is there. David's made king. He's king over all Israel. Here's the ark of God. And David says, wait a second. I got to build God a house. If you want the full details, go. This is your homework. Read 2 Samuel 7 today. You remember David tells this idea to Nathan, his prophet, and Nathan says, hey, the Lord's with you. Blank slate, baby, go for it. David starts to work on his plans, but that night the Lord comes to Nathan and says, here's what I want you to tell David. Tell David this. Have I asked you to build me a house? I'm paraphrasing. (laughs) David, this is God speaking through Nathan the prophet. David, you were a shepherd boy taking care of the sheep in the wilderness. And I've made you the shepherd over all my people. Did I ever ask any of the guys before you to build me a house? Did I ask you to build me a house? In short, God was saying, David, I don't need you to build me a house. Guess what? I am going to build you a house. I'm going to build you a dynasty. And there will be kings who come from you in an unbroken line. And your descendants will reign forever. That's the idea. That's the theme throughout the scriptures. So that when Jesus comes on the scene and he goes into the baptismal waters and we hear a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, that voice, the voice of God, is echoing these words here. Verse 7, you are my son, today I have begotten you. We have a king. And that's what this psalm is. Psalm 2 is a coronation psalm. We don't know if it was composed for David on his coronation day. Most likely it was composed by David for subsequent coronations of his descendants. So that every time 
a king of Israel rose to the throne, this would be part of that service, right? You're going to sing Psalm 2. We have a, a king. It's a coronation song, but it, it's so much more than that. It foreshadows great David's greater son. We have a king. All right, we'll come back to that in just a moment. But here's the second truth I want us to know. Although we have a king, we hate the king. And that's how the very first verses begin. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart. Let us cast away their cords from us. There is a king whom God has established and our hearts hate it. Our hearts hate it. In fact, this is what the church realized in the wake of Pentecost and the early life of the church. Remember, Pentecost happens in Acts 2, and then in Acts 3, uh, John and Peter heal this lame man, and they get in trouble by the religious authorities, and they say, hey, cut that out. We're going we're gonna to make trouble for you if you don't. Peter and John go back to the church and say, let's pray. And in Acts chapter 4, they pray, and this is exactly what they pray, this psalm. Acts chapter 4, they, they pray. In fact, if, if, you, if your fingers are fast, you can turn there. If not, let me just read it for you. Acts chapter 4, they say this, Sovereign Lord. This is in verse 24 of Acts 4. Sovereign Lord, who made heaven and the earth, the sea and everything in them, who, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit... They're going to quote this, this psalm in their prayer. Which is a pretty good way to pray, by the way. Pray in Scripture. But here's what they pray. Why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His anointed. That's straight from Psalm 2. But notice how they apply it. Verse 27. For truly in this city, Jerusalem... They were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan predestined to take place. You see what they're saying? They're saying, God, we see Psalm 2 in living color. Your king, your son, Jesus, the real king, the Mashiach, that's the Hebrew word, your anointed one, your Messiah, your king has come. And Herod and Pontius Pilate and all the Gentiles and the people of Israel, they colluded to kill him. And this is exactly what Psalm 2 says, that the nations will rail against your anointed one. They hate your anointed one. They will seek to burst the bonds of you and your anointed one. So God, we recognize this. This is the world crying out. Or excuse me, this is the church crying out. This is the fulfillment here. The world hates the king. Now, do you realize that? That we live in a world at war with King Jesus and his followers. I don't know how many of us still live with the kind of um, Disney World encrusted bubble around our lives. I, I think too often I live that way. I, I, I wake up and here's the sad thing. I can wake up in the morning and not smell smoke. It's dangerous because the moment I stop smelling the smoke you know what I do I start listening to the song I hear the drum beat of the world I'm not smelling the smoke I don't realize that those are the drum beats of battle it kind of sounds like a party to me if I keep listening long enough and then what happens I'm back in Psalm 1 I'm back in Psalm 1 I'm, I'm walking in the counsel of the wicked and then I start to stand in the way of the sinner and Pretty soon I'm sitting in the seat of the scoffer. And I hear that there is a king, and guess what? I'm okay with that. And there may be some people in this room right now, and you're like, you know what? Yeah, I understand Herod. Goodness. Herod wouldn't want the rule of Jesus in his life. I mean, Herod took his brother's wife and all that kind of stuff. We understand Pontius Pilate. He's nothing but a Roman pagan. And sure, the religious Pharisees, man, they're a bunch of hypocrites. Look like they're baptizing pickle juice all the time. We understand those guys, and yeah, the, the Gentile nations, yeah, Acts 4, we get that. Those guys hate Jesus. But we don't hate Jesus. We, we don't hate the king. We love the king, right? We love the king. 
No, 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 no. We love a consultant. That's what we love. We love Jesus a consultant. Jesus, we love you. We'll follow whatever you say. Um, well, I, I've made you in a certain way. And I, I want you to live in accordance with how I made you. I, I made you male and I made you female. And you can't, you can't change those things. That's good counsel, Jesus. And that works for some people, but not for me. So I appreciate your consultation, but I'm going to choose this way. Oh, no, we, we, we love you, Jesus. We, we follow you, Jesus. You're our king. Well, um, I've been noticing what you've been doing with your finances. And I, I, I'm telling you what I told the rich young ruler. I, you, you need to give it all away to the poor and come follow me. Uh, that's some great advice and counsel. And I'm sure that works for some people, Jesus. But don't work for me. So I will keep you on retainer as consultant. And maybe the next time you offer me some counsel, I will like it and I'll take it. We do not really want Jesus as king. We want him as consultant. And that's the reality. The Bible, the Bible realizes people don't hate the idea of God in general. They just hate the idea of the biblical God. <laughs> but the moment, the moment we start preaching through the book of Joshua, we say, I, I don't think my God would send people in to wipe out an entire nation of people. I got a real problem with the God of the conquest. That's not my God. And I say, I rest my case, right? We think that we do not struggle with this. But let me say, church, the only people I believe who are authentic Christians can say, you know what, I do struggle with that. I do realize deep within me, I do hate the king. And that's exactly what Romans 8, 7 says. If you want to turn there or just listen along, Romans 8, 7 says this. Paul says, the mind that's set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Folks, do you realize on our own, that's our condition? We're not neutral observers. We are enemies of God. We take our place with these kings here in Psalm 2. And, and why? Because, verse 3, we, we don't like the bonds. Right? We want to burst the bonds and the cords away from us. The word translated bonds could also be translated yoke. It has that similar idea, right? The yoke you put on the oxen to, to, to tame it, to, to guide it, to steer it where you want it to go. That's the idea. We don't like that. We want to call the shots. None of us on our own are friends of God. But you know what? The only way to become a friend of God is to realize you're his enemy. Do you know that? It's to see the deep, dark rebellion of your heart and repent of it and turn to him and we'll be his friend. We have a king, but on our own, we hate this king. But notice how God responds to this. Look at verse 4. And this, this, this can be a little off-putting at first. Verse 4, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. So we have already the church really is, has already spoken in this psalm, right? Lord, why do, why do the nations rage? That's what the church is, is asking. And maybe some of you are asking right now, God, why is all this turmoil happening right now around me? The church is already speaking, and now God says, I'm going to speak. And notice what he does here. Before he speaks, what does he do? It says, he sits, he sits in heavens, and the heavens laughs. So these kings... These rulers who are rebellion, who are trying to rebellion, who are trying to cast off the yoke of King Jesus, who don't want him as a king, they will gladly take him as a consultant. These people, all of us, right? It says he who sits in the heavens laughs. He holds them in derision. To hold someone in derision is, is to, to mock them, really. Is to, it's, the, it's the little boy who comes to you, the four-year-old, and his 
plastic armor with his plastic sword and says, I'm going to run you through. And you say, yes, Johnny, ha, ha, ha. That's what the Lord does. Except instead of calling him Johnny, he calls him kings. I almost mentioned a couple of rulers' names, or I thought, probably not going to do that. Just you insert the ruler that's on your own heart. Yes, yes, yes. Ha, ha, very good. He, he laughs. I, I don't know if you've ever experienced this. I'm sure some of you have. But I, I remember as a teenager, um, out late one night, probably shouldn't have been out this late, but I remember I was with a friend of mine. Uh, his name was Chris Bunch. Uh, Chris Bunch was, as his name indicated, there was a bunch of him. All right? It was a, he was a big dude, 6'4", six, 6'5", six, uh, at least in the 300 club. I don't know exactly where he topped out at. He's a big dude and, like, muscular, like, bull, strong, ox kind of dude. So we had just left the Waffle House, and he just spent, like, $80 on his meal. And I, I think we're going back home. I don't know exactly where. But there, there's another car uh, in front of us, and it's got four or five teenage guys in that car, and, and I'm riding with Bunch. He's behind them, and he's probably following them a little too close. Probably a little too close. We get to a red light, and they stop. We stop behind them, and all four of them jump out. I think four jumped out. The driver was still in the driver's seat. And they start shouting and, you know, putting up their dukes, come on. I'm scared to death. Let's get out of here. And Chris Bunch, he knew what he said. <laughs> he laughed. <laughs> and he got out of the car. I'm like, what are you doing? And when he got out of that car, he took two steps forward, and those guys approaching our car stopped. And the guy inside the car said, Guys, let's go. Let's don't waste time on this guy. And they all got in the car and left, right? And that's the idea. He who sits in the heavens. (laughs) Is that the best you got? Your nuclear missile system? That's it? Your little tower down there looks like a Lego stack? That tower? <laughs> it's pretty good. He who sits in the heavens laughs. You know, laughter, laughter is unique to the human species. Did you know that? Laughter, and I'm reading this from uh, some, psychology, some psychology article, so... Um, if it sounds good, it's not mine. If it doesn't, then it's not mine either. So, Laughter is really a form of nonverbal communication unique to humans. It acknowledges that more is going on than meets the eye, that more is happening than what is being captured into words. According to this article, laughter is, quote, one of the distinguishing features of human beings. And, quote, it may be the most contagious of all emotional experiences. Just think about sitting in a group of people and someone starts laughing. You may not even know what they're laughing about. What happens? You start laughing. Yet little, known, little is known about the mechanisms behind laughter. What is clear, apart from the practical health benefits, which this is a mind blower, it releases tension, lowers anxiety, boosts the immune system, aids circulation. Some of y'all need to go laugh a little bit. A lot of bit. I'm just kidding. Um, Laughter is, quote, a highly sophisticated social signaling system. Get that last part. Laughter is social. So, in other words, one of the reasons we laugh is because we are communicating something to the people around us. Even if, let's say, you get a text message and it makes you laugh, what do you feel you have to send back in response? LOL, right? I just laughed out loud and you know I was here. Because you're communicating something. You know what when he who sits on the, his throne, when he laughs, you know what he's communicating, he who sits in heaven and laughs? He, he's not laughing because he's tickled. Like, oh, Michael, that was a good one. <laughs> he's laughing because he's talking to you and me. And you know what he's saying? He's saying, I got this. 
think about the trouble going on in your life right now, the trials you're having to walk through, and God saying, I got it. He's laughing at everything in your life right now, not making fun of you, but just saying, is that the best the enemy can throw at you? <laughs> Hear God laugh, church. He is laughing in the face of your problems, not to mock you, but to encourage you. That is the best the enemy can throw your way. That's the best this fallen world can do against you. God says, I'll laugh at that. And why can God laugh at that? Because of verse 6. He has set a king up on Zion, his holy hill. Folks, don't be intimidated by the world. You put Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 together. In fact, some of the ancients thought they were one psalm because it starts off with the man who's blessed and the end of, verse, uh, end of Psalm 2 ends with the man who is blessed. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Starts with blessedness, ends with blessedness. You know why some of the ancients thought that to be true? Because there is a symmetry here and there's a connection here. In Psalm 1, we're being warned about being attracted to the world. In Psalm 2, we're being warned about being intimidated by the world. And being intimidated by the world is just as spiritually fatal as being attracted to the world. And God says, look, hear me laugh. God's sending all of us right now who believe in him through Christ a little LOL emoji, right? Some of you just text God this morning. God, I got cancer. He sends back LOL. Not to, again, not to mock you. Say, I got this. God, relationships are falling apart. LOL. I got it. God, I don't know if you heard of this thing called inflation, but it's really crippling my finances, LOL. I got it. He's got it because he has set his king on his heel. God laughs. And there is a certain establishment of his Messiah. That's why the Messiah now speaks in verse 7. The, the, the church has cried out, God, why is this happening? God speaks, hey, I got it. And now the son speaks in verse 7. He says, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, this is Jesus talking in this psalm. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. It's interesting, when you look at verse 7, that verse is quoted three times in the New Testament. The first one's in, he or one of them is in Hebrews chapter 1, where it's talking about Jesus being superior to angels. Which in the psalm, you think, man, that doesn't really, Psalm 2 is not talking about angels, is it? And then you go to Hebrews 5, and it's talking about Jesus not taking the priesthood on his, himself, but he was appointed to this. And, it, and the author of Hebrews quotes this Psalm 2, and you say, Psalm 2 is not really about priesthood, is it? Maybe the New Testament authors are just playing fast and loose with the Old Testament. No, 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 no. Acts 13.33, that's where we first run across it. And this is Paul preaching. In Acts 13.33, he quotes this verse. And again, if you want to turn there, you can. If not, just listen. Paul preaching in Acts chapter 13, verse 33. Here's what he says. He says, We bring you the good news of what God promised to the fathers... This he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it's written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Now get this, don't, don't miss this church. God says I got it. And the reason I know I got it is because I've already established my king. On Zion, my holy hill, which we know in the New Testament is Jerusalem, Mount Calvary, where Christ was crucified. And what the New Testament authors are saying, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, now something has happened. Something has happened that this one, Jesus, who was mocked and derided, he now stands as priest, the mediator between God and men. This one, Jesus, who was beaten and scourged, he now stands higher than any of the angels who have ever been created. This one, Jesus, he now can be the agent of God's LOL, God's laughing, because he is the one whom God raised up. He is the resurrected son. And that's how God can be certain, really how we can be certain that God has this. Which leads us to our last point. We have a king 
in our fallenness, we hate the king, but, oh, church, we need the king. And we've heard in this psalm the church cry out. We've heard God speak. We've heard the Son speak. And now in the last few verses, listen to the Spirit speak in verses 10 through 12. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Listen to the admonition. And remember that in Revelation 22, it is the Spirit and the bride who say, Come. And the Spirit now, through the last part of the psalm, is saying, Come. And how are we to come? Come, verse 11. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish in the way. For His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all those who take refuge in Him. Now, I had a lot I want to say about that, but... We need to bring this to a close. You know what the Spirit's saying? He's saying, look, you need this king. You need to be saved by this king. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Guess what? There is no refuge from him except in him. Did you get that? His wrath is quickly kindled. We don't like to talk about that. We don't like to talk about the doctrine of hell, but it's true. For those who do not repent and place their faith in God's only provision, there is nothing but eternal punishment. And that is why when you get to Revelation 6, the kings of the earth and the Gentiles, the great ones, the small ones, the rich, the poor, they start praying to the rocks and the mountains to fall on them, to hide them from the wrath of the Lamb and from the one who sits on the throne. But there is a way to be saved, and it's in the King. We are saved from God's wrath by placing our faith in God's Son. There is no refuge apart, but there is refuge in Him. You need to be saved by Him. You need to be satisfied with Him. That's what this whole kiss the Son in verse 12 means. (laughs) This is not the kiss on the cheek that the French do. This is not the kiss of betrayal that Judas did. This is the kiss of homage that one would make before a king as they bow down and, and kiss their feet. And by kissing their feet, they're saying, my allegiance is yours. My affections are yours. We need to be saved by this king. We need to be satisfied in this king. But lastly, we need to serve this king. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Serve this king. Serve this king. You say, well, how do I serve this king? Well, you remember in Matthew 25... I think it's beginning around verse 31 where Jesus himself, this is where he's finishing his sermon on, on the Olivet Discourse, on kind of his end time sermon. Matthew 25, beginning verse 31, Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne in his glory and all nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats and you know the rest of that the sheep he puts on the right the goats on the left and you remember what he says to the sheep come come blessed are you come and to the joy of your lord lord the joy of your lord and to the goats he says you will go away into eternal punishment and you remember what the criteria was for being labeled a sheep or a goat jesus says what you did to the least of me. When you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. Remember, he says, the goats are like, hey, what's going on? Jesus says, hey, I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. I was sick, you didn't visit me. I was in prison, you didn't come to me. They say, when, Lord? When you didn't do it to the least of these, you didn't do it unto me. Now, I want to close by making an application. If you have your bulletin on the perforated tab, let me point out something to you. There are some needs listed on this tab. And these needs are needs that we as leadership of the church realize if if we're going to serve our faith family well this fall, we feel like we need to have these things in place. And if you look at the tab... There's a lot on there. You say, man, there's a lot on there. I can't read it. Yeah, we got a lot of needs. In our preschool department, right, we we need 
Two adults to teach the two-year-old Sunday school. Two adults to teach the four-year-old Sunday school. That's what we need. In our extended session, that's like what's going on right now, right? So y'all, y'all think it's bad for you when I'm long-winded? Just go work the extended session, okay? That's nursery during this main service, all right? Trust me, there are prayers all the time being offered. That, 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 those workers pray more for me than anyone else, all right? Like, please let him get his point across on time, right? We need about 30 people just to join in the rotation. That's not an every week thing. That's just, hey, put me on the list. Maybe once a quarter, once every six weeks. I'll serve during this hour. I'll go love on some kiddos. We got a Wednesday night need for eight adults to work with our preschoolers, right? We need eight adults to step up and say, hey, plug me in. I'll do it. Also on Wednesday night, in our children's department, we need five leaders Two teachers for Sunday school in our children's department. We need two more men to serve our students, uh, to to work in a small group um, strategic plan that Trent Martin, our student pastor, has devised for this fall. You see, that was a pretty slick manipulation right there. It's not manipulation. It's application. Because I'm sure if Jesus had time, he might say something like this. Blessed are you, for when I had a dirty diaper, you changed it. When I was acting rambunctious and just needed a cup of goldfish, you gave it to me. When I was fidgeting and wanted someone to instruct me in the gospel, you got down on your knees and you did it. When, Lord, when did we do that for you? When you did it to the least of these, my brethren. You did it unto me. You see, that's what serving the king looks like. Yes, it looks in other ways too, right? It manifests itself meant to, for folks to come down and say, we want to be, uh, you know, send me to Africa, right? To the deepest jungles of Congo. Yes, that's serving the Lord. And man, I pray God would raise some up to do that. But it's also this right here. God is sovereign, and we respond to that sovereignty by submitting to him. That means we find our refuge in him, we're saved, we're satisfied in him, and then we serve him. Our founding fathers were certainly right to have an aversion to a king. But that's because King George can never satisfy the deepest longings of their heart. That's because the British monarch cannot save them from the wrath of God. That's because no king was worthy of their wholehearted devotion and service. But there is a king worthy. And he's been installed on Zion's holy hill. He was crowned with thorns. And he was raised up on his throne that we call an old rugged cross. Will you submit to him? Let's pray together. As we pray, Andrew's going to come. Lord Jesus, take us back we pray to that place where you were installed on that hill far away where the old rugged cross was. Yes, the emblem of suffering and shame, but yet we love that old cross because you, the dearest and best, for a world of lost sinners was slain. Lord Jesus, may every heart in this room not only cherish that cross, but bow before that cross and then serve you, Lord, with the energy you give us as followers of that cross. We pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, will you stand? Let's sing and glory in that old rugged cross. If you want to make a public uh, profession of faith, we want you to do that. There's room to do that. If you want to come to this altar, kneel and pray, we invite you to do that as well. You respond as the Lord leads you, even just standing there and worshiping. Let's, let's do it. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world.
Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown Oh, that old rugged cross so despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me for the dear lamb of god left his glory above to bear it to dark calvary and so i'll change My trophies at last I lay down And I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown Just let Andrew play softly for a moment as you posture yourselves in a moment of prayer just think about that old cross where you first came to see the light, as another song says, and the burden of your heart rolled away. Just go back to that moment. Ask the Lord. Say, Lord, you're my king. You're not my consultant. Where do you want me to be serving in your church? Maybe it's not some of the ways we mentioned, but maybe it's some other way. You say, I want to I talk to the pastor. I want to talk to another ministry leader. See where I can plug in. joy to sing and think on the cross. That's, that's why we're assemble. That's why we gather. That's why we scatter. Right? Hey, uh, some good things happening in the body. I'm going to ask Miss Kay Bartlett to come up here. Kay Bartlett, many of you may remember Kay. She was a longtime member here at First Baptist and, and uh, was led away for a time, but says she feels like the Lord is leading her back here to rejoin the faith family. So if you're excited about what the Lord's doing in Kay's life, would you say glory to God? We do. We give glory to God, okay? We look forward. Yeah, praise the Lord. Let's give a hand clap to the Lord. Look forward to incorporating your gifts back into the body. And, uh, hey, we'll sign you up for the nerd. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> pressure. Hey, is Charles he still here? Is Charles? Charles, he come on up here as well. And you want mom and dad up here with you? Come on, mom and dad. Let's, let's join Charles. Aren't we excited about what the Lord's doing in Charles's life? Let's just give another round of applause to the Lord. Charles, praise the Lord. Did Mr. Jeremy hold you down too long? All right, just want to make sure. Hey, again, we're stirring the waters again next week, and so you don't want to miss that communion service next week. As we, uh, Mike Allen's going to go and come to the pulpit and uh, close us in prayer. At the Amen, would you come by and let these folks know how glad you are that the Lord is doing what he's doing in their lives, and we look forward to seeing you back next Lord's Day. Allen, would you, uh, Mike, would you pray for us? Thank you, brother. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you with our hearts just so glad of what you have done for us. Father, you have given us eternal life through your Son. And Lord, you have blessed us so greatly. We thank you for it. We thank you in 
want to praise your name. And help us, Lord, to be your hands and feet. Help us to remember that you tell us to love you with all our heart, all our mind and soul, but to love our neighbor as ourselves. And these two commandments are the greatest. And help us to remember that that's what we are here to do. Lord, just be with us. Guide us and direct us. Forgive us for where we fail you. We ask this now in the name of Jesus.